so hopefully you can hear me now a little bit better. But just to um, remind you of all the good faces, Dr. John Higginbottom, who's our founding member uh, for our British Columbia Advanced Practice. Without him, we wouldn't be here. Uh, so thank you to John, Regina, myself, you see. Uh, thank you very much to Manny Ebbot, who's in the background, uh, doing lots of good technology. Um, at Jordan Clark, thank you very much. He's in the interior. Hopefully, he's not snowed in. And he's the man who built our platform for him so for us. So we're very grateful to Jordan. And Jennifer Cusack, who's uh, Manny's counterpart. Uh, so we're very good. That's our team. So you know who we are. And so Advanced Practice, you know, is funded by the Ministry of Health and provides leadership, education, and guidance to the mental health field to help provide and put effective evidence-based psychosocial rehabilitation practices into place. We have a great deal of gratitude for our webinar instructors who generally do this work without any compensation off the side of their desk and frantically learn a lot of new skills as they're often doing webinars. So really grateful to them for taking this on because it's an extra load on their work and we're very, very grateful to them. So thank you to them. Um, you know that our purpose is really to try and be a resource of support to you as clinicians. Um, we really like to hear from you. We, if you are aware of new and best and more promising practices, please connect with us. If you'd like to do a webinar, we would love to hear from you. That is really the nature of our work. We love to hear the evaluation. So after this webinar, you will get an evaluation to let us know how we're doing and how we can strengthen our uh, presentations or the material. It's also an opportunity if you have a material that you'd like to share, we would truly love to hear from you. So thank you. Um, many of you may have been following the, um, the fentanyl uh, work with CBC, um, and it may be of interest to you. There may be uh, particular topics in your local neighborhood uh, that you wish to bring forward, and we would very much like to hear from you. So uh, please let us know through the evaluation, or you have my email. I am very happy to chat with you as well. So on to my happy job, which is to talk to you about the presenters. So our first person presenting today is Dr. Maria Equenta. I hope I'm saying that uh, well, because every time I say that, I feel like I'm in somewhere that's Spanish speaking and it's warm. And uh, so we welcome Maria today. Maria is a registered psychologist and the coordinator of Center for Students with Disabilities here at Douglas College. She has previously worked in education settings as an instructor and a psychologist and supervised counselor trainees in a community counseling clinic. At Douglas College, she provides supportive services for students with a range of disabilities and also taught the STAC course 101, Essential Skills for College, a post-secondary credit course for students with mental health disabilities. And so we're going to hear a lot more about that course today. Just to let you know that Maria is we we'll prefer not to be on camera today, so if at some point your camera goes uh, quiet, you'll know it's just that uh, it will be Maria speaking, so just to be aware of that. Other speakers today is we have Jenny Cashmore, an occupational therapist who has worked in mental health services since 1990, and we were just sharing our vintage a few moments ago right. and realizing we're at that same time, <laughs> shall we say, um, but she has a strong person-centered and strength-based approach and has provided group and individual service to various community roles, addressing a range of recovery goals such as housing, employment, education, leisure, social lifestyle and wellness, independent living uh, and independent living skills, so an exemplary occupational therapist in Fraser Health Authority. And then we have dear Crystal, who uh, will speak to us today. She was born in Ontario and a few years ago found her home here in beautiful British Columbia. Uh, she, these are Crystal's words. She says, I am passionate and I struggle with mental health. That doesn't make me any less of a person. It does not define me. I aspire to speak motivation in others' lives. Personal coaching and mental health support from Fraser Health and individualized support and encouragement from the course instructor at Douglas College. Um, and today we're going to discuss key elements of the partnership between Fraser Health and Douglas College and key elements of the course design and delivery that lay the foundation for a continuum of care for our students in the course. Um, two of our students will share their experiences of the course and that's I think going to be a highlight of today's uh, webinar. And we're aiming for uh, 30 minutes at the end of our session for questions and answers. And the funding and the partnership started between Douglas and Fraser Health as a follow-up to a research project originally exploring how to support students with mental health issues in post-secondary studies. 
getting used to the technical stuff here. Um, um, so just to review our learning goals for today, number one, to identify elements of collaboration support from post-secondary and mental health settings that are essential for a well-supported academic post-secondary course. We want to, two, discuss challenges and successes of collaboration. Three, we want to identify examples of rehabilitation principles within the context of a supported academic college course. And fourthly, we want to learn, learn about perspectives and lived experience students who have taken the course. And that will be with um, the three big questions today as well. So next I want to talk about the partnership and sort of introduce the roles of who's all um, leading this partnership. The Douglas Scholars side, we have an instructor who is a learning specialist and the coordinator of the Center for Students with Disabilities, who also has a background as a learning specialist. Um, both of them have both of the people in these roles would have specialized graduate studies in the areas of education and disability. On the Fraser Health side, um, with the mental health teams, we have occupational therapists on most of our community mental health teams. And within that, we have usually one OT who is the liaison point person. Um, I'm currently filling that role this year. And the liaison would work between the college and all mental health teams that refer to this course. Um, we also have case managers who have various clinical backgrounds, such as social work, nursing, and counseling. And of course, last but not least, we have the client who's in their dual role as a student as well. So the OTs, case management clients, we um, all collaborate towards furthering person's goals, which of course includes education goals, um, as well as work and various areas of wellness. So just to use the flow of our presentation, we're going to talk roles in preparation before the course even starts, and more about the collaboration during the semester and the fall up after the course. And next we're going to go on to, Maria's going to share about the definition of supported education. And I'm just going to mute the camera. Thank you. Um, so the definition of supported education that we've selected for um, today uh, is from Karen Unger, who was a, and is, a pioneer of supported education for individuals with mental health disabilities in post-secondary. Um, and I'll just read the first part of her definition. Supported education is the process of helping people with psychiatric disabilities return to school by providing supports and services to them so they can enroll and remain in an educational program. Um, and she goes on to say that especially new students would need this type of encouragement and support. So next slide. Next slide. Let's do the partnership. Um, with Fraser Health and Douglas College, we're able to integrate a number of elements of supportive education within, um, within the course that we are offering. So we are coordinating with mental health services, so there is that uh, continuum of support for the students. Uh, the instructor who teaches the class has specialized background, um, must um, understand study skills and learning skills that are being taught, but must also understand the needs of students with disability and mental health disabilities, and takes on a different role that I'll talk about later uh, in, the, in the webinar. Um, there's financial support embedded within the class as well, which of course decreases uh, financial stressors. Uh, the instructor is available to provide support skills that are needed in the academic environment that go beyond what's being taught in the classroom. Uh, Fraser Health provides personal support and follow along supports for the students. And the course is really a strength based program which promotes hope and growth in our students. Excellent. Next slide. Yeah. So to tell you a little bit about the course, I'll give you a, a basic description. Uh, the course is a three-credit college course. It's been designed specifically to assist adults with mental health disabilities develop study skills, academic skills, self-management strategies for transitioning to college classes. Uh, instruction is offered in a supportive classroom environment with a maximum enrollment of 12 students. Uh, course content then includes very typical content, learning strategies, memory and cognitive strategies, active reading skills, reading comprehension, uh, library research, oral presentation skills, and note-taking skills. Students are expected to attend class regularly, to participate in class activities and group work, to complete assignments, to complete two oral presentations, and to demonstrate uh, overall improvement in learning skills. And the course is offered as a two hours by two day 
per week uh, block, which is very typical schedule for Douglas College classes during the day. Uh, the academic learning outcomes uh, that we expect are similar to other college study skills courses, but the course also serves to familiarize students with the post-secondary environment and the resources available to them. Instructor expectations, registration system, how to access a library, how to get your student card, for example. And finally, the course um, is also expected to help the students set achievable educational goals and to develop personal plans at the end of the course. Now we're going to transition. Hi again. So I'm going to talk next about partnership. So there's a lot of preparation that happens before the course even starts. Um, often you hear things can't happen without money. So one of the biggest ingredients in the partnership is Fraser Health providing the funding. And thankfully this has continued each year um, for the last 25 years. So um, with that funding, then the course tuition is free for students. That's a big piece. Um, we can provide some financial support for transportation, but most students will have their own classes. And then on the Douglas side, um, they generously fund their instructor time, coordination, co coordination and facilities cost. Um, student fees are waived as well in the college, and they provide textbook loans for the duration of the course. So again, another cost reduction. Um, so a big piece from the mental health role side is that there's a lot of promotion and a lot of communication. Um, basically, it starts out with myself, though, to on once we get funding in in the new fiscal year, in April, um, we start promoting the course to all the teams in, in Fraser Health. So basically, it's emailing out the course description, referral form, and learning plan, and I'll explain that more in a minute, and fielding a lot of questions and emails from various teams. Um, also, occasionally, clients and family members will call me up and ask questions as well. The mental health teams refer from a wide geographic area, so that includes Burnaby, New West, Port Coquitlam, Surrey, Delta, and even Langley and White Rock. The OTs that are on the respective teams help promote and consult about the referrals with their case manager colleagues to basically get the word out to as many clients that might find this course helpful for their academic goals. And overall, um, we tend to promote the course in sort of general terms like it's learning how to learn. And as well as promoting the benefits to the person's wellness and recovery. Um, so yeah, we meet with the clients to explore. Um, that could be the OT on the team or it could be the case manager. And we discuss the stack course, we explore the client's education and career goals, and then we complete the referral and learning plan. So the learning plan is essentially just a short screen that's done collaboratively with the client to assist them in identifying their goals and any needs they might have for support. Um, it gives also an overview for the college instructor and coordinator for when they meet the person later on in the summer. The learning plan includes before the course, if there's any issues with accessing the course, including practical things to do with their, as well to do with their mental health issues. During the course, we look at identify ways to help support attendance and participation and their overall functioning, basically to help them complete the course successfully. And then after we um, identify any support they might need to follow up, to transition to further studies. So sometimes clients um, need that assist to get into disability services or apply for a county student grant or any funding that they might be eligible for. Um, so yeah, when we meet with the client, I'm um, myself a little bit, but just we provide information about the course. We, it's a collaborative process to find out whether the course is right for them, but we also talk about other options for their educational and vocational goals and assist them by coaching and talking it through to see if they're ready from their own perspective. We don't screen them out and say, you're not ready, you can't apply for this course. So usually we just assist them in their decision making and then they decide if that's a right fit for them. All the referrals are sent um, back to the OT liaison and myself, I coordinate a running list of prospective students and then in this case this year, for example, myself and Maria, we would communicate ongoingly throughout the summer until we get that final list of students um, and then we arrange for meetings in August before the semester starts and the college instructor and the coordinator would meet with the students then. And then I, as the liaison, I commu communicate these final plans back to the teams and as well as the clients directly who are often calling in August saying, Mike, did I get into school? Did I get into school? What's going on? So sort of that communication piece. And then just before school starts, often the OTs um, might help their client a little bit with getting familiar with transit or even orienting to the college. And um, most importantly, often developing a routine 
It's going to support them getting to school. So next we're going to go on, Maria's going to talk about from the college perspective in the preparation mm -hmm. phase. So of course, there's a fair amount of preparation before um, the class starts. Um, and we do greatly value the coordinated referral system from Fraser Health. Um, the one point of contact with the coordinating OT is very helpful to us, as well as referrals that are coming in from case managers and OTs who know the students um, and know the course. Um, the information that's provided to us in the learning plan really facilitates that transition for the student from the community to the course college um, and helps the course instructor get to know the student before they even arrive so that they can serve them directly. Um, so Jenny mentioned that Douglas College will have inter uh, student instructor interviews uh, at the end of August and I coordinate those. Um, and that interview really serves a, a number of functions. It really it provides an opportunity for the student to come in and ask questions of, about the course, of the instructor, about the expectations, and through that to self-determine their own interest and motivation to attend the course and to make a decision as to whether they will register in the course or not. And typically there will be one or two students who say, it's not exactly what I thought it would be. Um, or, and then many more who will say, this is exactly what I want. Uh, the instructor also is determining at the same time academic readiness for a college level course uh, for the students and is learning about the individual's, uh, the individual's needs um, and so then this will serve as preparation for the first day, the first week of classes because the student comes in knowing what to expect comes in having already made an initial connection with the instructor and the instructor comes in already aware of what each individual student may be needing in terms of support through that first week. Uh, and then in addition to that, there's a lot of on-site administration that occurs uh, at Douglas College, um, such as making sure that the course is within the regular college registration system, that we have appropriate classroom and office space available, that our instructor is up and running, uh, that we have student cards for the students, that we've booked the research classes that are going to be taught by the college librarians, and on and on and on. Uh, you probably are aware that within institutions there's always a lot of administrative work that happens. Um, so next I'd like to say a little bit more about uh, the elements of the course design and delivery. Um, the principles of supported education are embedded within the course. Um, and so they're reflected then in our elements of course design and delivery. The course provides a way to ease in for the student to try out post-secondary, to see for oneself if one is ready, if it's a good fit for them, is this really something I'm wanting to pursue. Um, and um, so we have a number of uh, course design elements that assist with that. It's a small class, 12 students, uh, and there are two instructor office hours per week. So that really provides time and opportunity for individualized support. Whereas an instructor teaching regular classes may have two office hours for 160 to 200 students a semester. Um, so a very different setup as you can see. Our courses are scheduled midday to best meet the needs of students because illness symptoms can often affect ability to get going in the morning and get out the door. So we are really scheduling the course to, uh, pro to promote success for the student. There is a curriculum, but it's also flexible, so that provides the opportunity to adjust content and pacing of the class as needed by the particular classroom. And the grading system for the class is uh, what we call mastery grading. So what that means is rather than having a number grade for students who complete the class, the outcome, uh, what it will say on the transcript, is mastery. And this really assists students to focus on learning rather than getting uh, hung up on, you know, what number am I getting in this class. So the focus is always on the skill development and learning. 
it's a credit course, as I mentioned earlier. It's integrated within our college system, thereby the students become familiar with our environment and college expectations. Um, and it's three credits towards a general studies diploma. So that's very important, first of all, because many students would not be interested in non-credit opportunities. Uh, and secondly, it's an important recognition that students are learning college skills uh, akin to regular college skills classes. And uh, the content and skill development is integrated um, with the impact of mental health disability in mind. Great. Thanks, Maria. So I'm just going to start. Okay. And next we're going to talk about the partnership during the semester. Um, so just speaking from the mental health side, I'll do that. And um, basically just a circle of, continuous circle of activity happening from the mental health support. So basically um, the OT and the case manager and the team provide direct support to the client. Um, the case manager might focus a little bit more on the overall mental health coping and monitoring any stress or symptoms and um, actions needed. Um, if there is an OT and they are working with that client, they might do re periodic or regular check-ins um, to do such things such as re reviewing homework and assignments, um, boosting the study skills and applying some of the strategies learned in class. I was even doing that yesterday with a client who took staff class this semester. Um, monitoring routine and lifestyle and setting goals accordingly. Uh, providing coaching to problem solve and maintain confidence, etc. so that the person stays engaged with the course. And during the semester, the staff instructor um, will periodically communicate with the OT liaison. Um, just if there's any emerging issues or things that they're observing, any changes with the student, so then um, we can funnel that information back to the mental health team to address that proactively. Again, the goal is to, to help the student to successfully uh, learn and complete the course. And then if follow-up is needed, uh, sometimes I've had to track down a certain clinician because they're away or they're not available to someone that can support that client that follows up with and then following up back up with the instructor themselves to let them know what I've done. So that's uh, mental health in a nutshell and then just we'll transition to the Douglas College mm -hmm. role during the semester. So um, there are many benefits to our partnership and the communication with Fraser Health is I think a major benefit for us. Um, there, because there's a team that can help the student and that can help each other, help the students succeed. The instructor and I know that we can uh, pick up the phone to our Fraser Health OT liaison uh, and can pass on concerns and that someone will check in with the student and provide support and coaching. So for example, we might contact to say a student needs more support managing anxiety or might need some help arriving on time or might need help with issues that are interfering with attendance and participation or even at a more basic level sometimes a student may be hungry or might need some help with a living situation as well. Um, Back to on campus, the students have similar access to college services as students in uh, our regular college skills courses and students in our credit programs in general. And while the course syllabus looks similar to regular college study skills courses, there are differences in the role of the instructor and the course emphasis. And I'd like to talk about six key differences um, that are integral to the course. Yes, please. Um, So I'll briefly say a few words about each of these uh, differences. Um, the instructor takes an individualized approach based on individual needs of the student, but with the curriculum in mind. Uh, so for example, the instructor maintains ongoing awareness of each student, get, getting to know each student well, their strengths, their weaknesses, their goals, their purpose for attending the class. And while teaching in the class, maintaining continuous attention on each individual during the class. Uh, determining what is each student understanding, what is each student needing from the lesson or exercise, and checking in with each student as well. So the instructor is setting goals and expectations for each student within the curriculum, but with improvement relative to the individual baseline that the student is coming in with, because students will be um, having a variety of skills and backgrounds as well in the class. Um, the instructor will provide individual instructional assistance uh, and individual encouragement and support during their office hours as well. 
Um, a second key difference uh, that is built into the course is that the instructor communicates positive expectations and plans for student growth. So taking uh, care to give feedback in a way that bolsters the student um, and taking care to redirect in a supportive way. So using the example of public speaking, which are the oral presentations that the students do in class, the instructor is quite explicit that public speaking is actually the number one fear for all people, but it's really important to academic work and they will be asked to do presentations in their other classes, hence why we include it in the class. Um, and that helps the student to face that fear in a supportive environment and helping the student to learn that they can do this and grow from their efforts to do this. So providing positive feedback and encouragement as the student progresses from their own starting point. So the message is, you can do this. This is possible. Uh, and the starting point might be one or two sentences, but moving on from there. A third difference is uh, a really flexible approach to meet individual needs of the students within the class. So of course being flexible with due dates because the goal is to support the student to meet the academic requirements and to complete them. So doing what is needed to make it possible for the student to complete the presentations, doing what is needed to help the student um, meet the attendance requirements. So encouraging students to come to class even if they're late, even if they haven't perhaps done the assignment, uh, emphasizing how important it is to be there. Uh, also being flexible with the volume and content of the class to ensure that learning occurs. Uh, and then adjusting the pacing, finding the right balance between lecture, between teaching, between skill development and practice, and classroom management time. Uh, the instructor as well is working to create a very supportive classroom environment. So is attending to group, group process throughout the class uh, and student safety in the classroom and um, is also teaching social expectations for the classroom in a very supportive way, being very explicit about maintaining awareness of others in the classroom, such as turning off our cell phones, uh, returning from breaks on time, listening to the speaker. Uh, the instructor is modeling acceptance and respect in the classroom and is providing guidance as students adapt to post-secondary. So a very important goal is for the student to build a sense of themselves as a capable student and to facilitate that transformation from student coming in as a client from Fraser Health to seeing themselves as a very capable student. Also, the instructor provides ample opportunity for skill development in a class, much more than would be provided in um, a regular college class. Um, so in doing this, the instructor would start by providing good, clear instructions in a multitude of ways, not taking any skills for granted, and then introducing each um, skill activity slowly, providing a structured introduction, modeling the skill, allowing the students to practice the skill in class, uh, letting them put the skills in action in a number of different ways and times, and the instructor's role is to observe and provide individualized feedback, but then fading out that support as student skills are improving. And then finally, the sixth key difference is uh, that the instructor is uh, really attending to the impact of mental health disability, so would explicitly teach strategies that can address the impact. So for example, strategies that might address impacts on concentration, that might address impacts on memory, uh, that might emerge as impacts of medication side effects. Um, is very open to the student experience in class uh, and during individual appointments. And then consequently, the students are more open about the impact of their mental health disability, which in turn facilitates the student to develop some strategies that will help to mitigate the impact and to learn that. Great. Thanks, Maria. That's yep. really the bulk of the course and mm -hmm. you summarized it really, really well. Um, so I'm going to start my camera. And thank you to Jenny for um, handling all the technology on our behalf. Oh, you're welcome. So um, in preparing for um, this webinar, I was really, really thrilled when I tracked down two students and they were so willing to be part of our presentation and be a part of our team today. So um, first I wanted to introduce Reef and she'll say a little bit about herself and talk about her experience with the course and what she's doing now. Welcome to Reef. Hi. 
My name is Rape. Why I chose post-secondary education. I go to college part-time because I have a busy schedule at home. And I found doing two courses was double the work and commute was hectic. So I chose one course this semester. During, during my time off, my time off of school, I study and read and take notes. The Cornell note taken away. And on my weekends, I prep the kitchen, do the chores. Um, what I like about college, it provides me structure, self-discipline, and focus. Learning and writing keeps me mentally stable. Before, I was all over the place, unstable, unfocused, couldn't concentrate. Now I'm on the right medication for my anxiety. I tend to get worried a lot, stressed out a lot, and get overwhelmed by life. It just drains me. And I sleep a lot. I use a student planner like this. I'm great. Okay, move it back this way. <laughs> oh yeah. I use a student planner and I take day and I take it day by day to keep track of my days. I was growing up I was always a slower learner and my grades were always a C were always in the C's. To me my education is about observing what I learn and my discipline is focused on one subject at a time. But what I'd like to talk to you about is magnet cognition. We learned this in the essential study skills class. Um, it's about understanding how you learn, what you learn, and learn strategies that could ex that's based on one's personal style. I'm all, my learning disability is a visual spatial learner. We did this in um, stats class. Um, it's based on the Howard Gardner multiple intelligence. And uh, they give you techniques for taking notes. So, through, so four techniques is taking notes in a colored pen like this, four colored pen. Four colors? Yeah. yeah. Blue, green, black, red. Um, and I see, and I have to visually see information or else I, I wouldn't get it. And I take annotated notes like de definitions, facts, process and steps, and details. I visually see pictures and demonstrations. That's how I learn. And in class, we learned about uh, the benefits. Okay. In class, we learned about um, three models of learning. There's visual is seeing, audio is hearing, and kinesis is physical movement. I'm more visual, so I see things. I like to pass the mic on to Crystal. <laughs> okay. So I'm just going to introduce Crystal, and she can introduce herself better. I'm going to just change the slide. And it's Crystal. Hi. So I'm Crystal, and I'm originally from Ontario. I was born in Mississauga, raised in Oakville and Hamilton. And about six years ago, um, like late teens, I came out to BC to go to treatment for my eating disorder. And I ended up staying out here. I really loved like the mountains and uh, just the environment here in BC. So yeah, I chose to stay. And it's been quite a journey since then. Um, I went to, first started at Douglas in 2013 in the Child and Youth Care Counseling Program. And unfortunately, I got quite sick with um, my eating disorder and anxiety and depression. I had to be hospitalized for about six months. And that resulted in me leaving school. So I've been really, you know, working on my recovery and bettering my health. And I was told about the STAT class through my mental health team. And when I first heard about it, I was really excited and intrigued because um, pursuing my post-secondary education and really succeeding is, is a goal of mine. And um, I've always been really passionate about you know, educating other people and um, just trying to finish my post-secondary education. So I agreed, and um, at the beginning of class, the first 
the first week, I was actually in the hospital again. Um, just had to get refed and stuff. And I was disappointed because I thought that I wouldn't be able to come back. But it was a short admission, and I was able to to get motivation and to, to keep, um, to do everything I needed to do to be well so that I could go to school. So I contacted the instructor, and they said that I could come, even though I missed the first week. And I was super excited and motivated, and uh, it really... Um, it gave me drive to keep going. Um, yeah, so... <laughs> so in the class, um, I learned quite a lot of skills. We did, like, presentations, and we learned about, like, note-taking and stuff, and all those skills really um, helped me just be ready to pursue post-secondary after this class. So now I'm taking a few classes. I'm taking psychology and humanities. And uh, my hope is to, I decided not to pursue child and youth care counseling. I kind of want to pursue a degree in clinical psychology. Um, the class challenged me to stay well. And even continuing post-secondary education, it challenges me every day to stay well so that I can succeed and so that I can be a pillar to systemic change and uh, just really um, using my experiences to help other people and, and to help uh, the system. Um, yeah, all systems have you know, pros and cons, and I, I really just want to kind of help make it better. Uh, the, the stat class was a doorway for me to continue following my dreams. It, I, like, before that, I was really sad. I was really depressed. I, I was in and out of hospital. I stopped eating. I had to be tube fed. And when I heard about the class, I wasn't planning to go back into post-secondary just yet. But I was like, no, this is great. And it really provided me that motivation and, and that purpose that I needed to continue to thrive. And that's where I really learned that I'm capable and that I can do this and that anything is possible. And I really want the world to see that anything is possible because we all have challenges. And uh, I just want you all to know anything is possible. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tarif and Crystal, for sharing. It's awesome. And that's why we're all here. I just wanted to touch maybe a little bit more um, quite his personal story, but just some of the other comments that we've observed um, for, and things that we've seen with the students that go beyond the academics. Um, a lot of times people talk about meeting people, developing friendships, maybe starting a dating relationship. Um, people often express feeling very connected and understood by their peers. Um, one student was saying it's really nice to be in a class where they know that everyone else is challenged with some kind of mental health issue. The other thing is people often talk about taking pride. That maybe people in their lives or friends, family are saying, what are you doing lately? And that they're able to, to answer that question say I'm going to school. Um, another thing for people, it's um, just in our lives when we try and make change, just stepping out of our comfort zone. So of course going into the college setting is a big step out of our comfort zone often and that's huge in people's recovery. Um, and then the other thing is really just making decisions about life goals and I think both um, Reef and, and Crystal illustrated that as well. That It's the academics but it's also just helping to move forward and make decisions about what you want to do. So I'm going to talk a little bit um, about partnerships after the course ends between mental health and the college. Um, essentially, not a lot on the mental health side, other than if we are, um, we, we get the academic outcomes from the college, and that's shared back with the teams, the people that referred those clients originally. 
and the OT or the case manager would follow up at their respective teams um, to support the person continuing with their academic work or other goals. So, for example, I might have referred a client and I follow that along with that person to help them connect with their next course or whatever supports they might need or funding, such as that. Um, we've often, we've noticed that most um, client students do go on to register for at least one other course or courses the next term. And some students have um, transitioned directly to more intensive programs. So there was one fellow that went on to BCIT, Forestry and Wildlife Management, um, someone that went to Emily Carr University to study art, and some have gone on to the Douglas College Therapeutic Rec program, just for some examples. So overall, we've, um, as mental health team clinicians, we've observed that the course helps people build skills and wellness to further their educational role. And then it helps them decide, like we've said, if the school is right for them or right at this time. Um, and I wanted to just share one um, anecdote I got, a little story I got back from one of the OTs on the team who shared his experience with a client recently that kind of sums up some more of the benefits that are beyond the academics. So he wrote, um, a young male client who had been repeatedly turned down for part-time work. He would get so nervous in job interview situations that he would un be unable to even answer questions. And being rejected from so many jobs it obviously affected his self-esteem, um, but to the point that he actually stopped looking for work. And he became depressed and unengaged with activities that he usually liked to do. He lost his routine and would sleep late in the day and stay up late playing video games. We discussed going back to school as an option. He thought that was a good idea, though hesitant, because he thought, you know, maybe he would fail and be right back where he started. Um, the OT and him, he said he, we worked through this and he ended up attending Stack. He would plan his whole week and routine around this course. His sleep and eating routine, oops, his sleep and eating routine got back to normal. He started doing things he liked again and there was a noticeable improvement in his self-esteem. After Stack was completed, he decided to find part-time work again. Instead of going on to other studies, he approached employers with confidence and was offered a part-time job shortly thereafter. He continues to do so well that I barely see him anymore. So that's always a good sign when people really go off on their own and don't really need our supports anymore. So I'm gonna do the next slide to talk about the Douglas College after the course. Good. Okay, um, so Douglas College has uh, a number of roles after the students have completed the course and um, one of the things we do is we help the student access the the services, continued support from the Center for Students with Disabilities at Douglas. So we um, start the intake process around the fall, the end of the fall semester. So those students who are wishing to continue uh, in the January semester have already met with a learning specialist, have discussed accommodations, have talked about their plans. So in that way, easing transition to further studies. On occasion, the instructors provided letters of reference for students who have been going into a program or elsewhere where an academic reference is needed. Um, so it's nice to have that available for the students. Um, and then there are the administrative uh, responsibilities and planning for the next year starts actually uh, in May after the course. Um, as coordinator, I produce the annual report on our student outcomes and uh, provide student feedback on the course to Fraser Health Mental Health Services. Um, and um, we have an annual review meeting with Fraser Health uh, Administration where we are planning now for the next course that is coming up in September. So it really is a cycle of uh, planning, preparation, and delivery across the 12 months of the year. Um, I'm hoping that gives you a picture of what the uh, what the course is like and how it serves as uh, an example of a supported education credit course. And um, I think we're now um, open for questions. Yep. And I believe Regina is going to assist us with that. Yep. Do you want me to put the yes. Okay. So I'm just going to scooch in here in the middle. <laughs> Good at scooching. Scooch, scooch. <laughs> So what a wonderful presentation. I'm just here as a Douglas College employee. I'm just having a little glow because I think it's really an amazing program. And I know that because our two speakers who are present help me understand from their perspective really some of the key 
components of this program in terms of their rehabilitation and recovery. And what I was struck with is just your story um, that really helped us understand that this program helps you to stay well, that it really helps you to, to manage the anxiety and gives you a focus and gives you a, something to feel very positive about. Crystal, I was very impressed with your story too, just in terms of how you said that it challenged you to stay well. And I think that that's, that's you know, that's, that's a component of any program that I think trying to get there is incredibly, as you design and deliver programs, it's, it's, that's where it's at, isn't it? To really provide some sort of support that really somebody saying, well, this is, this is showing me that I'm a good person, that I'm competent and capable, and that you know, it's essential to my health. Because it's just, you know, it's just pulling me in there. Yeah. So I hope that we have some more dialogue about that. What is just a joy as well. We have somebody on the webinar who would be willing to share a bit of their story, a graduate. Oh, and they have just asked if they could really say a little bit. Um, and I know that we have some other um, questions as well. Um, so I'm just going to ask for whomever's on the line if they wish to... Uh, just take the mic and speak, oh. and just uh, we'd love to hear from you. We've never had this before, and I, I'm just thrilled to see that. If there's anything we can do to make that communication easier, just please let me know. Hopefully you can hear. In the meantime, maybe just as you're gathering your thoughts, perhaps, um, maybe we'll um, attend to some of the other questions. I think one question was, and I think, uh, Jenny, you answered it, but how long was the program going? And I think you said 25 years. Oh, it, yeah. It's, well, it started 25 years ago, and it, um, it goes for one whole semester in the fall. Right. Yeah. So back to Fantastic. the 90s, I think. <laughs> and then another right. question. Yes. Uh, back to the 90s. <laughs> Definitely the 90s. That sounds like a TV program. Um, <laughs> But um, another person had just asked, how has that shifted over those 25 years? Mm -hmm. Maybe I think the implication was how maybe has the content shifted or how okay. has the program shifted? I'm not sure. I think Maria would best answer that. Sure, I can talk to that. Um, uh, so I believe the research and the course was first offered in 1993 or thereabouts. Um, and initially we had a... Um, a set, um, I wouldn't say a curriculum, but a set workbook um, around reading comprehension that the students would complete. Uh, although the assignments have remained the same, the oral presentations and learning about study skills, et cetera. Um, and so as t um, it has been a credit course from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. That hasn't changed. Um, over time, uh, it's become more similar to other college skills courses in the sense that we now use a textbook that is used in college skills courses rather than a workbook that was developed specifically for the course. Um, the course outline, I think, has not changed very much in that time. And the expectations for students in the class in terms of completing presentations and in developing better study skills, uh, developing strategies for themselves, attending class, that has been there from the very beginning. Super. So some shifts over the years, um, uh, but some of the core content is very similar. It That's right. Like. Mm -hmm. Cool. Funny, when we came uh, to to uh, prepare for this morning session, we had a tremendous conversation about technology, which of course we're relying heavily on today. And the question was, well, when were computers actually, when were they developed? And I just, I have to say, I had a little chuckle at that, but mm -hmm. I expect that maybe some, there's some additional technology as well. Yes, perhaps. and for me as an instructor, having access to a document camera when I was teaching um, sometime in the uh, mid 2000s was very exciting. But students doing presentations in the early days would not have been using PowerPoint slides. And now the students are learning how to use technology as part of their presentations. Because that, of course, is what's expected in the other college classes that they'll be taking. That's so cool. I'm just mm -hmm. chuckling here with Jenny. Uh, we were, as we yeah. are about the same age, of course, we went to OT school. and We were remembering university days when there was no internet. Not a PowerPoint <laughs> insight. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, 
Jamie's on the line, and Jamie says, I took this course maybe three or four years ago. So I think, Jim, uh, Jamie, you, you're able to type, and maybe you want to tell us a little bit more, and then I can share it. Uh, you said that your professor was named Alona, mm -hmm. and, um, and that's cool. And if you just want to type some more, then I can just share it with the audience who might not have access. In the meantime, we have a couple of other questions as well. I think... You'll chuckle at the first one, but can somebody who doesn't have a mental health team access this course? Oh, and Jenny says she can speak to that. Thank um, you. Yeah, I forgot to add, it's kind of a, a small detail, but it's an important one, is that uh, I believe that it is available for anyone that self-identifies as a mental health issue with a mental health issue that's connected with a clubhouse. So the, um, the person that went on to Emily Carr, for example, I, I know him through the Burnaby Clubhouse, and he was not a mental health team client. He might have been at one time, but um, we do get referrals from the clubhouses, and that's maybe not as well known. And that also reminds me this year to promote that to the clubhouses. So thanks for that question. So perhaps a person has to identify with men have, have a, living with a mental yes. illness and maybe have some sort of mental health support, yes. perhaps. Yeah, so they could go perhaps through their GP, but they could get connected to a clubhouse and then access the course that way. So um, it's usually good to... to um, Put your name forward in sort of April, May, June of the year, so to make sure that you could. Get and I expect that's uh, in the region of Fraser Funding. Health. Yes, yeah. Fraser Funding Health. starts in April. And I know Maria has an important. Yeah, I, I was going to mention that it is for Fraser Health clients. Um, and in the past, um, Vancouver Coastal Health has sometimes wanted to refer their clients, and um, we have been able to to open up the doors to them when we have space. But I'll, I'll have to say that there's rarely space available for right. anyone outside of Fraser Health in the course. Well, 12 seats are pretty precious, aren't they? Mm -hmm. um, so maybe we'll just go back to the conversation online here. Uh, there was one question. Uh, would this course be beneficial to somebody who, doesn't, who already has a degree? Um, um, I think uh, it's hard. Well, I can't say I know every single client that's gone through, but I, I do know, um, even just this last year, I was working with a young person who had been like in third year engineering or something when he became ill. Extremely intelligent guy, and he'd been actually a millionaire by the age of 27 and stuff. So he, um, you know, it was helpful for him. He wasn't getting out of the house, and, um, so he built, built his confidence, and he went on to take more. Courses. I think I have heard of people who've done degrees, and it's been a while since they've been in school. Um, um, but it seems to be more for people now who may not have been in school before, and younger people who might have had a, uh, an interruption in their studies, like Crystal talked about. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's borne out just by Jamie's text here, who says that he. Um, he was in the course three or four years ago, and he had a previous degree in molecular biology and psychology. My yeah. goodness, how I don't know how a brain like that works. That's that's really amazing. Um, um, and um, Jimmy says, I thought this course was great um, for all education levels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'd like to add to that. Uh, there have been students when I've taught the class who had master's degrees. Um, and a number of students who already had degrees who may have gone through a period where they were ill and were wanting to come back and this was a starting point for them or a way to ease back in. Uh, and the feedback from those students was, was that it was helpful to them. And that's exactly what Jamie's on, mm -hmm. online is saying as well. So I don't know if, if, our, if, our, uh, if you want to say any more. Um, if you have any comments about just what you've heard, either, either, uh, either people, if not, I don't wish to put you on the spot, but if you do, <laughs> yeah. yeah, hey, there you go. Okay, I graduated in 1996. I went to college for two years, but I didn't complete a program. And then I went and moved back to my hometown. And then the town fell apart, so I came back out to the lower mainland. I did retail jobs, but they weren't no future in retail. Mm -hmm. So I thought it'd be better to go back and get my education, and then uh, if I could get funding. And then I saw Douglas College with this um, study skills, and 
by luck, I got in. <laughs> There's a lot of last minute planning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah. it does give us an understanding too, just of the complexity too, just sometimes when the illness hits that it just, it, it promotes a different life path perhaps. And then just going back to school might have been, uh, you were saying a good option for you. And uh, Jamie was just saying that um, for him, having had that uh, coming back into this course, he just um, was, he felt confident enough to go back and search for work after the, after the course mm -hmm. and now works at Canadian Mental Health Association. How about that? That's yeah. really, thanks for that. That's, that's yeah. really exciting, you know, and I'm sure as people who are part of the program, it's it's so nice to hear what our graduates are doing. So thanks for the courage to come and, and share that story with us today. I really appreciate it. I hope I've done a good job in uh, highlighting some of the questions. Um, I loved your metaphor about it being a door, uh, a door open for next steps. And, uh, and that might be something that Douglas College might want to do something with that, just in terms of visual um, for mm -hmm. advertising, because I think that's really a strong metaphor for a new beginning and possibilities. Mm -hmm. I was also impressed when you were talking about um, the nature of the course and the principles um, that you found the course on, for example, just the individual approach, the uh, strength-based approach, the flexibility or choice, um, the skill development, and attending to some of the, the tricky parts of uh, learning to live with mental illness, both the strategies for managing the illness and then the, perhaps the cognitive challenges that some uh, people experience. So mm -hmm. when I was thinking about the intersection between best and promising practices and the course that you're offering, it's very clear to me that it's solidly, certainly part of supported education. So mm -hmm. really cool to see that in mm -hmm. action. And I, our stories helped us understand that a little bit more as well. James Ad. James adds, resilience and accepting your new reality even if it's less good than the one you had before, you can fight it. You can do nothing but scream about what you've lost, or you can accept and try to put together something that's good. And that comes from Elizabeth Edwards. And I know dear James, and he, I don't know, somehow has this, this toolbox of quotations that mm -hmm. seem to really make sense at the time. I don't know quite know how you do that, James, but that's really amazing. James says, thanks very much for this amazing students who shared their strength and resilience. And Tyler says, I work full time in a decent pay too. It has changed my life uh, because having paid employment is pretty huge in my self esteem and it has helped my mental health immensely. And that came from Tyler, but I, I suspect that was actually Jamie, who was a previous graduate, who said that because I know he was using Tyler's, <laughs> uh, Tyler's uh, type Screen. in email. Yeah, okay. sign in. Thank you. Yeah. So I think we've heard much about inspiration and resilience and a program that's working really well. Oh, and I think Jennifer has a, an additional thought. Oh, okay. no, I'm just going to do the last two slides. Oh, yeah. Cool. Just to say thank you so much for being part of our presentation today. And there was some resources that Maria had added on supported education, just to call your attention to those. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested in reading a little more, all of these resources are available on the web. Uh, I've got the um, reference for Karen Unger, who has a, a web page uh, on supported education. Um, and the last reference is um, for the University of Massachusetts site, uh, their psychiatry department, they do research around supporting uh, employment and education for young adults. Uh, and the link I've given you is to all their uh, web pages, uh, tip sheets, publications, and webinars on the subject. Brilliant. That's a really well informed and lots of uh, personal experience. Of Thank you, both our speakers, um, for
for your generous contribution to our really super presentation today. So thank you, Crystal, and thank you, Reef, for your immense contribution, because I think it's all very fine to talk about these things uh, intellectually. It begins to make sense, but when you have a sense of people's experience in their heart and um, just uh, uh, their general experience, it just comes alive. It makes a lot more sense. So thank you kindly. Um, Taylor says, this was a really good session. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I I wish more courses were supportive as supportive as this one. Mm, me too. <laughs> that was a, that was an absolutely yes from Crystal as well. <laughs> so we have a few minutes. If anybody has any more questions, or if it's time to close shop, that's fine as well. Um, you'll know that in two weeks' time, we are going to hear from another employment program, Gastown Vocational Services. Mm -hmm. um, who provide in particular uh, services for youth and that promises to be a really compelling presentation as well. Uh, we totally appreciate that supported education uh, draws a, a very particular group of, of clinicians who may be very focused on supported education um, but we really value your input. We'd love to hear from you. If you have a session that you would uh, be interested in presenting, Please do let me know. Shoot me an email. I'd love to chat with you. And I'm just going to check and see if there are any more questions. I see Taylor's, um, Taylor is just typing something. I will, after this session, just send out uh, your certificate as usual and then just a request for feedback. So I'll send that out in about five. Okay, so Taylor's allowed. Last question for me, do you plan to implement this philosophy in other mainstream courses? Oh, isn't that a good question, Taylor? I'm not sure if somebody at the table wishes to take this up, but I do have a little something to say about that. I'm, I'm not in the academic role. I guess we, we provide the mental health support as much as we can from a team perspective, um, especially the OTs and other rehab specialists, for sure. Um, we can't do that with every individual client and student, but we try and individualize that support as much as possible and link them with the existing supports at various colleges and universities. Um, in terms of other courses, yeah, I, can't have, I can't speak to that. Um, I, I guess what I would say is that the course is fairly unique because, of course, it's funded uh, with the support of Fraser Health. Uh, and 12 students in the class. So that is not going to be generally available, I think. Um, we do have uh, special education classes that uh, provide this level of support, uh, such as a transition program, um, occupational education programs, a career and employment preparation program at the college as well. Um, but what I would say is that Douglas, like other institutions, has a center for students with disabilities that provides um, access support for students and accommodations in that way. And it's, every institution will have a counseling department as well. So that support uh, is coming from different areas, um, not simply as a supportive education course, but within the college environment in general. Thanks for, thanks for that, both of you. I would add that I think there's a great deal of interest in third level education around some of these components and trying to implement, for example, a strength-based approach to education. So for example, myself and a colleague, Dr. Sky Barbrick, have been asked to come to McGill University in about six weeks to speak about a strength-based approach for their uh, physiotherapists and their occupational therapy educators. So they're looking at about how are we trying to implement some of those things. And I know there's a small group, a small team here at Douglas College also uh, doing some similar things, trying to think about how to offer more choice, how to be creative in terms of the uh, delivery of the teaching material. So I I know that's not exactly what you're asking, 
But I am saying that some of those components, such as the choice, such as the um, uh, student involvement, such as looking at uh, strengths, uh, such that we're looking at experience strengths to be able to help that individual to maybe tackle some of the more challenging things that they may experience. But um, yeah, a little bit off topic, but I think uh, also complementary to your question. So with that, maybe we will say cheery bye, and we will say <laughs> see you in two weeks. Thanks, as always, for your kind attention. Thanks for your your. Um, so uh, Tyler says, I think Sky is also having some of my other colleagues speaking with her. That's fantastic. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, yeah, and Sky, two weeks ago, um, did a wonderful session with colleagues colleagues from the YMCA downtown on Broad Street. If you haven't seen that uh, session, it's archived. And we had a gentleman who uh, received that support in that program as well speak about his experience. And it was, uh, again, a powerful, a powerful presentation around education and support for youth uh, in the Granville Street area. So it was really cool. So with that, we will say bye-bye and have a great week and stay safe with the snow. And uh, bye. Jenny, wants to say bye -bye. No, I'm just saying bye-bye. That's it. fantastic. Thank you. And from our speakers, we say bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye thank you. Thanks for having us. Oh, you didn't get it? Great. Oh, <laughs> <Bye. laughs> <That's> great. <laughs> Good on you.